This is FHRC Brony Ready Controlling Cars, and this is a tour of my daily driver. This is a 1995 Toyota 4Runner SR5 V6. And better known to the folks over in Japan, this is called the Hilux Surf. This is the second generation of the Toyota 4Runner, and the first generation of the first model year of this particular generation of the 4Runner was released out of the factory in 1989. This in particular is the 1995 model year, which marks the last year of the Gen 2 4Runner, where, where it changed to the Generation 3 4Runner in 1996. Now, despite this is being called the Toyota 4Runner, it is not four-wheel drive. As you can see, there's no CV joints, no CV shafts over here. And also, it's pretty hard to see over here in camera, but I don't have a front differential. You can also tell, well, at least for now in, in this part of the video, this is a true two-wheel drive 4Runner. It is not a four-wheel drive 4Runner with its four-wheel drive disengaged. More on that later on in the video. And without further ado, Go ahead and check what's underneath the hood. Pull a latch over here. Opens up the hood. I'm gonna open up the hood off camera. So we're underneath the hood of the car. And as I said before and earlier on in this video, this is actually the SR5 V6. And this does have a V6. It's a three liter electronic fuel injection uh, V6. And to the Toyota enthusiast, this is actually referred to as the 3VZE. Now, this is the en same engine that you will also find in the first generation Toyota 4Runner from the 1980s and also in the old Toyota pickups before the Toyota pickup was renamed the Tacoma. This engine produces about 150 horsepower, which might not seem like a lot to all of you hardcore off-road guys and also horsepower freaks. But to be honest with you, nobody's buying this car for its 1,000 horsepower, zero to 60 mile an hour burst, you know, zero to 60 in 2.5 seconds or blah, 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 blah. Nobody's buying a 4Runner because it's fast. You're buying a 4Runner because it's tough, it's rugged, and it's reliable. Now, speaking of reliability, the engine, yes, the engine is underpowered. And 150 horsepower doesn't seem like a lot for this car, but it is enough to get this car going. Because also, keep in mind, the four-cylinder counterpart of the Toyota 4Runner, the 2.4-liter four-cylinder, also known as the 22RE, only makes 116 horsepower so you do get more power you do get a higher out power output in the 3VZE so at least this thing has a little bit more power and a lot of get up and go compared to the 22RE now as far as reliability is concerned on this car I have actually have no problems with this engine so far and I know what you're thinking a lot of all of the 3VZE owners have suffered a lot of head gasket failures now the question is did I suffer that? The answer to that is a plain and simple no. I have not suffered a single head gasket failure on this car ever since I got this car from my uncle. This thing is running perfectly fine when I got it. Well, aside from the whole misfire thing, but we just had to rearrange the whole distributor wires and now it fires properly. Anyways, as far as repairs on this engine goes, I actually my first repair on this actual on this car as a whole was to replace my valve cover gaskets because underneath the car it was leaking some oil and i felt on the back of the valve cover ga of the valve covers and they were pretty darn wet so it was it was my valve cover gaskets that was uh, going bad now that was a real pain in the ass to work on because i had to also to go to the passenger side i have to take the whole intake manifold out and for this side, I had to take this throttle body out 
this intake, this air intake, and possibly this part of the air filter. But aside from that, it was not a very difficult job to do. Um, uh, it just needs to take some time and effort to actually get those valve covers, uh, valve cover gaskets out so you can do a valve cover gasket repair. Another maintenance thing repair I did to this car, um, most recently I actually did was replace my water pump and my timing belt because my water pump was also was leaking coolant and the water pump is actually located, I know you probably may not see it, but over here where this lower radiator hose is at, that's where the water pump is at, right next to the thermostat. And that was actually leaking coolant, so I went ahead and replaced that and also my timing belt since I was right there and which also requires me to take this fan shroud out to take well first of all i had to flush the old coolant out take these uh, take the pipes out remove the fan shroud so on and so forth take the timing cover out and do all that work but um, but fortunately it was an easy process I, as i actually organized them in ziploc bags so it's easy for me to uh, reassemble the whole engine uh, reassemble the timing cover back up and so on and so forth without actually having to uh, dig around in through my parts bags. So that's pretty much all the major work that I've actually done on this engine, aside from my AC, because my AC is actually not blowing cold air. I replaced my compressor, but unfortunately that did not do justice. So I am going to go ahead and try to find other, uh, other parts on the AC system that I actually do need to repair. But aside from that, this engine has been dead reliable with me and has never disappointed me in all in about the two years I've owned this car. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and start the car up for you and give you guys a couple of revs and, and hear the engine for yourself. And yes, I did do the timing belt replacement myself. And in fact, when I did my timing belt on this car, that was my first time working on the timing on a car, period. Since the engine is uh, kind of cold, I'm just going to give you the small revs, nothing big. Now let's go take a, take a look inside the car. Okay, here I am inside my 1995 Toyota 4Runner, SR5 V6. And it is a pretty simple interior. Nothing very surprising, nothing special. It's simple as it can get. As Doug DeMiro says, why make three buttons? It works. You have a simple gauge cluster, tachometer on the left, speedometer on the right, battery and fuel gauge all the way to the right, oil pressure level, and engine temperature level on your far left. And also, your indicator lights, well, your turn signal lights are up here, but your all your other lights are down below. 
During the time this car was built, this car was not equipped with airbags. You have a standard climate controls with your fan speed, low, medium, medium high, and high. AC button, even though my car has no AC, doesn't work, but you do get AC. You have um, uh, circulation inside the car, or have the outside elements blow some air with it. Cold warm, you want face coolers, face coolers and knee coolers, knee coolers itself, knee coolers plus windshield defroster or windshield defroster. The only thing I don't like about this car, especially when it comes to drinks, especially when you're going to get yourself a large Coke from McDonald's, it's kind of flimsy. Not saying it will break, but I don't know about longevity. This thing right here and that thing over there, those were not included in the car. Those are just something I added. This is for my phone, for my GPS and stuff, and that's for my dash cam. Just like any car from this time period and also from the early 2000s all the way up to somewhere maybe around the early 2010s and stuff, you do get yourself a 12 volt cigarette lighter over here. And also some ashtrays with $6 inside. I also mentioned earlier on this video that my car is a two-wheel drive only forerunner. And what you see here is true. How can you tell if a forerunner is four-wheel drive or two-wheel drive without looking underneath underneath the car to see if there's any transfer case or any front differential or even just a badge that says four-wheel drive? Well, it's simple. Go inside the car, and if it's just the transmission lever itself, then it's two wheel drive only. But if it's the transmission lever along with a, a nut with another lever next to it, then that's four wheel drive. Because that second lever next to the to the transmission lever controls the four wheel drive, which actually is connected to your transfer case. But in my case, my car is not four wheel drive. But it is a three speed transmission with an overdrive. So, technically four gears. And it's also electronically controlled. As you can see here, it's an ECT. This is an ECT button. ECT stands for Electronically Controlled Transmission. So if I push this button, and if I accelerate, the engine will read up to all the way up to the higher RPMs to allow me to have better acceleration. If I turn that off, the car will shift at a lower RPM. So basically, if I push this button, activate the ECT, the engine will rev up to higher RPMs before it starts to shift to the next gear. And if I turn it off, it will shift to the next gear at a lower RPM, thus giving me better fuel economy. Even though forerunners were not really meant to be fuel efficient. Because keep in mind, nobody buys a forerunner for fuel economy. <coughs> Fifth gen owners. All right, let's get into the back of the car. Get out of the way. Sitting in the back seat of this 4Runner, um, if you're kind of a tall guy, you might be a little bit claustrophobic here. But as for someone who's like five foot something like me, it's not too bad. However, you don't really get a lot over here. You just get a, a bench, a whole bench seat, and that's it. But it is pretty darn comfortable here, I must say. Now we all know about the stow-and-go seats on modern SUVs. You basically fold the seats forward, and there you go. You get more cargo space. I did not know about this thing at first in this car because I thought that this is supposed to fold the rear seat forward, which is true, but it doesn't go all the way down as it, the headrest blocks uh, interferes with the front seat. I later found out 
that actually how this works is you you take the headrest out or somewhere that you'll still be able to find and then this seat actually folds and there's a little latch over here that you pull and go like this but whatever that seatbelt is and then you pull this and there you go extra cargo space all right so let's say your family had a long day at the restaurant or at a bar drinking and stuff now they're drunk but your but your seats are still down in cargo space mode well Toyota has some luck for you all you need to do pull this thing right here pull the backrest if this thing comes out there you go now it's locked into place nothing's going nothing's moving and then take the lap belt lap belt off move it somewhere somewhere get to it Push this part of the seat down, put this down, grab your headrest that you throw them somewhere in, on the floor. And there you go. Now you can take your drunk family members back home. This is one of the coolest things of the Toyota 4Runner. And to be honest with you, this, this trait has been around in older SUVs before the 4Runner, such as the for Bronco and I believe the K5 Blazer, which is this keyhole over here. You twist it and the window goes down. It's also it's also controlled through the switch inside the inside the car by the transmission lever. With the rear window down, you don't have to go ahead and open the tailgate to put your groceries or whatever you need to put inside in the car. You can easily just go ahead and put whatever you need without having to take this thing off. But if you do need to take it off, all you need to do, this particular SUV doesn't have the way that most modern SUVs would go through, which is opening it like a hatchback. This actually opens like a pickup truck. So basically, there's a latch behind here. You pull this handle and there you go. And the real benefit to this, if you're in a sit down movie, or whatever going out for a barbecue or something there you go you can sit down without having to worry the some modern cars actually have this feature which is some of them have been the Land Rover a Range Rover I should say and also in Toyota's case the Land Cruiser I'll go ahead and close this up and to close the tailgate not tailgate the, the rear window with the key, twist it counterclockwise, and the window closes. I am going to keep my windows, my rear window slightly cracked open, so at least there's some uh, air coming inside the cabin because like I said, my car has no AC at the moment. And finally, last but not least, let's talk about the roof rack. This is just a standard roof rack that Toyota actually gave when this car came out of the factory. Uh, this is actually an option. Uh, it's not a much required thing to do, but they are an option. There are plenty of forerunners I, I know from this same generation and also from new generations that don't have a roof rack. Either the owners have removed them or it came from factory as an option. And so there you guys have it, ladies and gentlemen. This is my 1995 Toyota 4Runner SR5 V6 and a little bit more in-depth tour. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be driving this in this video, but I will have some driving videos of me in this car. So keep on the lookout for those, and I'll talk to you guys again soon.